What if I told you that the smartphone in your pocket started as nothing more than ordinary sand? How does something so simple transform into the powerful chips driving our digital world? Today, we're diving deep into the fascinating process behind. The invention of semiconductor materials, why they matter, and the incredible science turning sand into technology. Grab a coffee, settle in, and let's uncover the magic, right here on History of Simple Things. Before we jump into the manufacturing steps, let's clarify what semiconductors actually are. Semiconductors sit in between conductors like metals, which let electricity flow freely, and insulators like rubber, which block electricity. Silicon is the superstar here thanks to its natural abundance and unique electrical properties. By adding specific impurities to pure silicon, we can control its conductivity precisely. That's called doping. Every journey begins somewhere, and in semiconductor land, that somewhere is sand. More specifically, quartz sand rich in silicon dioxide. Mines in places like Nevada or Australia supply this raw material. Once it's mined, the sand is crushed and heated with carbon in an electric arc furnace to about 2,000 degrees Celsius. This reaction yields metallurgical grade silicon, about 98% pure. That's still not pure enough for chips. Next up is the chemical purification. The metallurgical silicon reacts with hydrogen chloride, HCl, to form trichlorosilane, CyHCl3. This gas is distilled multiple times until it's extremely pure. Finally, under hydrogen at high temperature, Trichlorosilane breaks down to deposit nearly 100% pure polycrystalline silicon. To make wafers, we need single crystal silicon. Think of this like building a perfectly ordered skyscraper rather than a pile of randomly oriented bricks. The Chokrowski method does just that. A tiny seed crystal of silicon is dipped into molten polycrystalline silicon. Slowly and precisely, the seed is pulled upwards and rotated. Temperature controls ensure atoms line up neatly, forming a long cylindrical bool. Temperature fluctuations can introduce defects, so fab engineers monitor everything down to fractions of a degree. After a day or two, that bool can be as big as a broomstick. It's then carefully cooled, inspected for internal flaws using x-rays, and measured for diameter consistency. Now that we have a silicon ingot, it's time to slice wafers. Diamond-coated wire saws cut the bool into thin disks, typically 200 to 300 micrometers thick. Every cut generates tiny particles and surface damage, so after slicing, wafers undergo a multi-stage polishing process. Fine abrasives and chemical mechanical polishers remove scratches and contamination leaving a mirror-like surface. These polished wafers might look simple, but they're the canvases on which microchips will be painted. Uniformity in thickness, flatness, and surface roughness is critical. Any deviation can lead to circuit failures. Here's where the magic begins. Photolithography is like high-precision stencil art. First, wafers receive a light-sensitive coating called photoresist. A mask with the circuit pattern is aligned over the wafer. Intense ultraviolet light shines through the mask, transferring the pattern onto the photoresist. After exposure, the wafer undergoes a development process. The exposed or unexposed photoresist, depending on type, washes away revealing parts of the silicon surface. What remains is a perfect pattern ready for the next steps. Modern fabs use deep ultraviolet or even extreme ultraviolet light to achieve ever smaller features, now down to just a few nanometers. With the pattern set, etching removes material from the exposed areas. 
This can be wet, chemical solutions, or dry, plasma. The result is microscopic trenches, holes in structures etched into the silicon. A modern microprocessor can have over 50 layers built on a single wafer. Between circuit layers, we deposit insulating materials, usually silicon dioxide or low-K dielectrics, then open vias, holes, so metal wiring can connect different layers. Metals like copper or aluminum fill these channels, followed by chemical mechanical polishing to ensure a flat surface. Each layer demands another photolithography, etching, and deposition cycle. The choreography of hundreds of these steps in the correct order takes weeks, even months of fab time for a new technology node. Post-fabrication, wafers go through wafer-level testing. Tiny probes touch pads on each die, checking electrical performance. Dies that pass get marked, the rest are scrapped. Then comes dicing. Precise laser or mechanical cutting separates each tiny chip. Individual chips are placed into protective packages. Whether you need a simple dip, a ball grid array, or a spectacular system in package design, the goal is the same. Protect, connect, and dissipate heat. Once packaged, chips undergo final testing under various temperatures and voltages to ensure reliability. You might be thinking, that sounds incredibly complex and expensive. You're absolutely right. Fabrics cost billions to build, and each step demands precision down to the atomic scale. But semiconductors power everything from healthcare equipment and renewable energy inverters to smartphones in the cloud. They've transformed how we live, work, and play. So what's next? Researchers are exploring materials like gallium nitride and silicon carbide for power electronics, offering better efficiency. 2D materials like graphene and transition metal decalcogenides could usher in transistors even smaller than today's. Plus, advanced packaging, 3D stacking, and chiplets are reshaping chip architectures. Quantum materials and spintronics are on the horizon, promising faster, more energy-efficient devices. One day, we might look back on today's semiconductors the way we view vacuum tubes, quaint but foundational. And that's a whirlwind tour of how semiconductor materials go from sand on a beach to the brains of our most advanced gadgets. We covered everything from raw silicon purification and crystal growth to slicing, lithography, and packaging. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for our next video, feel free to share them in the comments below. We'll be sure to give you an acknowledgement for your contribution. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history of simple things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories woven through the smallest details.